awaken. To rouse from sleeping. To stir to life. To wake from slumber. To bring back to consciousness. Awake my soul, wake up, O oh sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake. Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem. Awake, awake, Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Awake, north wind and blow. Awake, harp and lyre, awaken the dawn. Awake as in days gone by, as in days of old. For when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. Hi, I just magically appeared. Um, I got a, a video in, uh, introduction. That's incredible. I've never had that before and I feel very special right now. Uh, it is so good to be here. Um, my first time in uh, Vancouver Island, um, and it's been beautiful. I heard that it was beautiful. People have told me my whole life, you have to go to Victoria, and I'm like, yeah, I'll probably never go. Um, I'm Canadian. I'm from Ontario, sadly. <laughs> the armpit of Canada. Um, I was born in Hamilton, even worse. Um, I'm the grandson of uh, Italian immigrants who like died on top of like shoveling coal at, at one of the steel factories. I come from very low-born stock, um, and uh, but it's good to be here with all you, all you cool West Coast people. Um, amazing, uh, Pepe, I love you so much. You are so cool, and I love what you and Leah are building here. It's just incredible. And um, it's just a real honor to be here. Um, and I'm sorry uh, for what's happening with your son. <laughs> there is no financial future in theology. <laughs> he needs to stay in business school. <laughs> so I will rectify that situation for him. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it is a privilege for sure to, to get to be a part in any way of the kingdom of God. Um, because we're building something that's eternal and, and that will last. And um, I want to build things that Jesus is building. And Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, uh, meaning that, like, the church is raiding hell. Um, and I, I just get a sense that that's what you guys are doing here. You're taking ground. you got a new building. That's huge. It's going to be a game changer for Connection Church. <laughs> Um, and I know that the best is yet to come. You're just scratching the surface of everything that I believe God has called you to do. Um, and I just want to say this to your team, which is incredible. I, I've so enjoyed um, how the excellence that your team, um, you know, just does church with, the, from the worship to the greeters um, and just everything in the lobby, just, you know, the video and all that stuff. And I know it. it um, to have something like this, it takes a lot of volunteers um, right, that's like that's blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, and I just want to say this: like, no good church has ever been built by lazy people. Yeah. You know, like it, it's like great things always require like you know perseverance, you know, and perspiration, um, and that's what you guys are doing. And so I just want to say, like, just that's amazing. I was a part of a church in New York City for eight years, and we had thousands uh, of decisions, hundreds of thousands of decisions, people come to know Jesus. And uh, I remember the five in the morning bump-ins uh, and, you know, being the last man out sometimes at, at 11 or 12 at night uh, and having the church hangover on a Monday. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, we had like, I think the most services we ever had in one day was nine services. Um, and most, most days it was four and I had to be at all of them. 
um, as a volunteer and then as a staff member. And um, I, don't, I don't regret a single minute. You know, it was, a, it was an honor. It was a privilege. And uh, we really enjoyed that. But, like, great things require that. They require that investment. And so I just want to encourage you. Maybe you've, you've never served before. Um, man, this is good soil, you know, to plant your life in um, and, and to be a part of something that's growing that you can sense that God is here, you know, like, and he's doing something. And so I would encourage you to be a part of it, you know. Let your feet go down deep um, and, um, and make... Make the place better than it is yeah. by serving with the gifts that God has given you, you know? So, all right, let's preach. <laughs> so um, I'm married to Jasmine. She's Australian. We've been married for 11 years. Um, I have a son named Leonardo. Um, he's five months old, I think. Um, he's, he's amazing. I'm uh, going home to see him tonight, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and... Um, Marriage is wild. Um, Tim Keller says that, uh, so the, 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 in the United States, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, Tim Keller, uh, who's a pastor in New York, or was a pastor in New York, he passed away last year, uh, but he said that, uh, the, you know, the national divorce rate in the United States is, is uh, seven years, I mean, seven year itch, it's a real thing, and uh, and he kind of guesstimates that the reason why people are married for seven years and, and then they, they, they part ways is because you wake up, you know, in the seventh year and you're kind of like, who did I marry? Um, and my wife and I have certainly gone through that, um, you know, around year six, year seven. It's like, you're not the person that I married. And the truth of the matter is that dating is all lies. Um, you know what I mean? Like, you're fudging the numbers because you want the job. Right, um, and and then uh, uh, after that, and, and to be honest, so you know, so you're lying, and then the, the person is willingly deceiving themselves. You know, it's like the red flags are always there, <laughs> right? But you, we human beings are amazing at not just manipulating other people, but manipulating themselves, <laughs> um, and 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 we are master projectors. Uh, and we idealize, you know, the, uh, we, or we project onto our partner the idealized spouse in, in, in those early days. And so uh, I'll give you an example. Like uh, your wife is uh, of Italian descent, okay? And, and she's got her Nona's secret recipe from the old country for spaghetti sauce or something. And, um, and so you're not wild about it, but you're like, you're a dude, you know, you'll eat, you know, and so you're, and she makes it, and you're like, oh, it was, yeah, it was good, you know, it's like, well, it was edible, um, <laughs> but it wasn't what your use or whatever, you know, like, and so, you know, for five years, maybe, you know, she, she'll, she'll pull it out at special occasions, you know, and you're like, you're, you know, you're, because you're just eating, you're like, you're not going to make a fuss over it, you're just like, you're, you know, food, my, 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 you know. And then, like, you know, year six or something, you have this moment of transparency where, you know, she's like, hey, how, how would I make my special sauce? You're like, how about not? <laughs> right? Like, let's go to the keg, you, you know? And she's like, what are you talking about? Like, you love it. I'm like, I don't, actually don't. <laughs> you know? And that's how long it takes many times for people to, like, be honest, and for the spell that we, that projection that we, like to realize, oh, they don't, right? And like, that's year five, year six for most people. It's like you wake up, you know, who have I married? And then you have a decision. Do like, uh, my mom says this, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. And so that's kind of marriage. <laughs> you know, it's like you go, okay, like, am I going to stay committed to this person that I don't know? who maybe fudged the numbers, but maybe I believed my projection, right? Like it kind of takes two in, in, in this sort of strange negotiation, right? Um, and, and so that's, yes, you know, so I mean, so we've, that we're continuing on. We're, so I'm trying to find out who my wife is um, and, and vice versa. You know, she says that she married a musician and now I'm preaching. It's frustrating for her. Um, and, uh, and, 
And, you know, so I'm, I'm figuring out who, who, who Jasmine is as well and trying to pay more attention, you know, to that. Um, my wife likes avocado toast. She's Australian. I'm from Ontario, rural Ontario. We had a, like a, the Tiviotdale truck stop. That was where we would eat breakfast. They don't do avocado toast at the truck stop. You know what I mean? Uh, like in rural Ontario, you're getting... Uh, Canadian bacon, you know, back bacon. We just call it bacon, obviously. Um, and, you know, pork links and eggs and maybe some beans, um, some, you know, whatever. And in Ontario, they, they bring out the toast on a separate plate, right? Because the toast isn't really invited to the party, right? It's, it's over there. And you eat the toast after you've, you're done eating the important things, Right? And, and typically, I mean, begrudgingly, you know, and you mask the taste of toast with, with jam or something. You know what I mean? It's just not, it's not, it's not a feature uh, in, in, in an Ontario breakfast. And I suppose that's changing a little bit. You know, all these Australian cafes are popping up everywhere. God forbid. Uh, but in Australia, uh, avocado toast is like, it's why they got up in the morning. Right, and 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 they'll pay thirty six dollars for avocado toast, right? And and so for me, I would never think of loving my wife with what I consider to be garbage. Do you know what I mean? Like I I, I don't think I ever ate an avocado until I met my wife. You know, like and um, much less been able to identify it at a grocery store. Um, but, you know, I, I love jazz, and, and I want to make her happy, and she loves avocado toast. And so I have learned about avocado toast. I've learned what kind of toast she likes. It isn't just, you know, the white bread that I grew up with that has no nutrients whatsoever. She likes sourdough. It's sourdough toast that she's into, right? Okay, so, so I'm at Trader Joe's, and I get sourdough. And then uh, she likes, uh, I've learned to identify uh, an avocado, and then I know which ones are ripe and which ones aren't ripe. Like you pr- push your thumb in, and and if it goes way too far in, it's too ripe. And if it doesn't go in at all, it's not ripe at all. Right? You just got to be got a little bit of an indentation there, right? Um, and then she doesn't like you know the gallon olive oil. She likes the the you know the, the high quality producer, single origin from Italy, right? The olives have to be virgins. <laughs> Right, she doesn't like that the trailer trash table salt that, that I grew up with. Right, she wants that pink Himalayan salt bay salt. Right, that's and 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 so I've lear- I'm paying attention to the details because that's what Jazz, Jazzy likes. In marriage, like you're supposed to love the person the way that they want to be loved. Right, that's a, that's what the experts say, and 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 instinctually. I don't, I don't think to love her with that trash. <laughs> you know, like I, I think, I, I want to love her with, with the, you know, the, the farty farmer meats platter. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like that, that's what I think of when I'm like, oh, I'm going to give her the best. <laughs> She's going to love this, but she, that, that repulses her, right? What I would eat uh, is, is not, it's, it's not an acceptable sacrifice, um, what, what she wants is avocado toast. And so, and so by, f- by finding out what she, what she loves and then giving her the toast, that's how, we, that's how I love her, right? And now people have preferences, right? Would you, would you agree? Like people have preferences. My wife likes to drink French wines. I can't stand them. I, 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 do, I do not drink Pinot Noir. <laughs> On the nose, it smells like tennis balls and it tastes like dirt in your mouth. Right? I like a jammy cab sav, you know, Camus all day. That's how I roll. Um, but right, and, and I, right, I would never think of drinking her dirty tennis ball water. <laughs> right, but that's what she likes. You follow me? That's her preference. And would you would you admit or agree that people have preferences? 
And like, we're not supposed to like begrudge them their preferences. We might not understand their preferences. It's like, how could you be into that? It's disgusting. But I, I get, you know, to each their own, as the saying goes. You, you following me here, right? People have preferences. Well, God is a person. He's not an impersonal cosmic force, right? He's, God's not a vibe. God's not vibes, right? God is a person. And as a person, he has preferences. And we know this because of scripture. The Bible is God's self-revelation. It is him saying, hi, hello, it's me. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and he's, he, this is who I am. I want you to know me. I, I can't know my wife exhaustively. I'll never know Jasmine exhaustively. Right? I'll never know everything there is to know. I think it was Oscar Wilde that said women are not made to be understood. They're made to be loved. <laughs> it's a good one. I saw it in a bar somewhere in Ireland. <laughs> And, um, and it's so true. It's like, I, I, don't under, I don't necessarily understand her ways. I don't understand God. I'm never necessarily going to know God exhaustively, even when I'm standing before him in eternity. I'm going to be like, I'm not going to be like, oh, I got it. You know what I mean? I'm, right? No beginning, no end. That's going to mess with me for eternity. You know? Um, I'm going to be just as flabbergasted as I am now looking at him. I can't know God exhaustively. I can't know Jasmine exhaustively, but I can know God accurately. And I can know Jasmine accurately through their self-revelation, right? So I don't tell Jasmine what she likes. She tells me what she likes. Yeah. Yeah. You following me? Yeah. Right? I think sometimes as Christians, um, we're tempted by spirituality. And spirituality is essentially, um, it's, it's idolatry, which is you, you construct your own God. Right? Uh, it's like um, Ricky Bobby's prayer in Teledaga Nights. Yeah. Right? He's like gathered with his family and he's like, you know, dear, eight pounds, six ounce, baby Jesus. You know, it's like he's, he's praying to this, this fabrication. You know, like his God is this little baby Jesus. And it's hilarious, but many of us are like that. We like project onto God what he's like. I, I call it Christian Buddhism. Where it's sort of like, you, right, it's this projection and, and you've, you've kind of assembled, it, it's like a spirituality, but, but it's, it's a non-invasive spirituality because if God is a person and he has preferences, it really messes up how much say I have in the matter. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's non-intrusive. Now I can keep it at a distance. I can keep him at a distance. But if God is a person, now it's a relationship. And relationships are hard. Right? Some people, I don't know if perhaps you've been on Facebook ever. I don't recommend it. It's horrible. Um, but... In the last maybe 10, 15 years, I've seen a lot of conversation on Facebook uh, about religion versus relationship. And people say that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And that is true. Well, I think it's half true. I think it is a religion. You know, I'm, I, I'm not against anything that's organized. I like organized sports. Don't have a problem with that. Um, But it is a relationship, absolutely. And the reason it's a relationship is because God is a person. He self-reveals in Scripture that he's a person. Um, but I, often at times, I believe that some people say it's a relationship, not a religion, because they, they treat their relationship with God the way that they treat their relationship with other people. They just project, and they're in control. And a relationship means that they can get away with everything. <laughs> You know, buckle up, Lord and Savior. We're doing all the things that I want to do. 
We're going to Swish LA again. Not Swish LA again! How's the chicken dinner, Jesus? Right? That's not a relationship. I've been in a relationship for 11 years. There's a lot of things you can't do in a marriage. And I can't tell my wife what to think. Dear God, no. Especially an Australian woman. Right? Like, I have to listen to her. She has to self-define. I ask her what she wants. I don't tell her what she wants. You following me here? God is a person, and he has preferences. And Christian worship, if I were to summarize it, and this is where we're going this morning, Christian worship is finding out what God likes and giving him the avocado toast. That's what it is. Okay, are you ready? We're going to read some scripture. All right, let's read our first passage. There it is. Psalm 141. This is David. And he is, uh, this is one of his band on the run songs. He was on the run for his life all the time. Uh, And uh, he is, this is probably during the Absalom uprising. Um, He is out in the wilderness or something, hiding, trying to figure stuff out. And he's going, God, I want to I be with you. David is obsessed with the tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle was this place where, essentially, it was a pitched tent where the ark of the Lord was. And David loved the presence of God, obsessed. And he loved worship. Um, he knew what God loves. And he wanted to give God everything, the avocado dose, all of it. Okay? Um, and... Um, so he's, he's, he's writing this song, and he says this, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you. And he's praying through the tabernacle furniture. Um, there was this holy place, or the Holy of Holies, where the, the Ark of the Covenant, you know the Ark of the Covenant, the golden box? Remember Indiana Jones? They open it at the end, Nazis' faces melt off, that one. Okay, so it's God's presence on earth. It's a great movie, I know, it's insane. Steven Spielberg, probably half Christian. We're claiming him. Um, so, so he's like, God, I want to be. So, so there's the Holy of Holies, and then there's this, um, this veil. And on the, immediately on the other side of that veil, there's a table with an altar of incense. And, and the priests were to keep that incense burning perpetually in front of the ark. And so God can smell that incense, right? Because it's going through the, the curtain there. Um, and and. And David is saying, God, you know, like that incense, it's, it's right there. I, I want to be so close. And, and when I pray, I'm over here. I'm not at the tabernacle. But when I pray, would my prayers, would you smell my prayers even from here? Wow. Yeah. Right? And God's going, yeah, I smell your prayers. In fact, David is prophetically, you know, I mean, Jesus says that David writes in the spirit, right? It's the, the spirit, Dave, David is obviously writing knowingly, but the spirit is inspiring him. That's how scripture works. Um, and so David is anticipating, well, essentially he's describing what's happening in eternity. We see in the book of Revelation, the prayers of the saints rise up before the throne of God. So when you pray, God smells your prayers. It's pretty cool that, they, that we have access that way. That God, every time you pray, God's going, oh, that... That smells so good. I love that we're connected right now. And so, you know, and then he says this, and the lifting up of my hands, Hebrew word for hand is yod, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice, as in I've read the book of Moses, the law of Moses, and God, you've revealed what you love, and I want to give you what you love. You want roast lamb? I'm giving you roast lamb. But I can't bring that sacrifice to you because I'm out here in the wilderness. So, if, if I lift my hand to you, could that be something that you're into? And David is prophetically anticipating New Testament worship. What we did this morning, what we practiced this morning, we don't do it because we're huge into English Premier League football, right? And this is what they do when they watch Liverpool and chant, right? Like, no, right? This isn't just Christian karaoke. Like, we're, 
right? We're, tr we're, we're trying to give God things that we see in Scripture, that he's, his self-revelation. God's into hands. Right? David, lifting up a mic with that, God, does this please the evening sacrifice? It blesses you. It pleases. And it's like a sacrifice for me because I don't necessarily want to do it. I don't even understand it, but like I'm giving it to you. And God's going, hey, I love hands. <laughs> He's into it. It's something that he loves. It's insane. Fast forward to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 13. He, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians who are thinking about leaving Jesus. They are under incredible persecution, socioeconomic. You know, if you became a Christian during this, this period, they boot you out of the temple. They boot you out of the synagogue. They boot you out of the family. They don't do business with you anymore. These people are going broke. And their detractors are saying to them, how do you even worship this new God of yours? You don't have a temple. You don't have sacrifices. You don't have a priesthood. You, clearly, you're not listening to Moses. You have nothing going on. And the book of Hebrews is like a systematic polemic against their detractors saying Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than the priesthood. His priesthood is way better than their priesthood. Their priests died. Jesus is alive. Right? His priesthood is a Melchizedekian priesthood, and they use Old Testament precedent to, to, to slam the detractors. Jesus, it's a better covenant. It's a better blood. It's a better altar. We, and, then he, and then it terminates in Hebrews 13. We have better sacrifices. So if people are asking you, how do you worship? Cool. We have Old Testament precedent. Read Psalm 141, verse 2. Your boy David, he said that lifting of the hands is like the evening sacrifice. And so, the, so they essentially copy and paste it. Here, through Jesus, then, let's continually offer up. Meaning you can do it all the time. You don't have to be at church. You don't have to be at a tabernacle or a temple. You can do it continually. And you can continually offer up this sacrifice of praise or sacrifice of yada. The patristics believe that the book of Hebrews was written originally in, because it was an encyclical letter written to the diaspora. And so it's, it's, it's written first in Hebrew. We have Greek manuscripts, but it would read sacrifice of yada. Yada is the Hebrew word for praise. And the root word is yad, hand. It just, just means to wave the hand. Yada, like praise, is hand waving. Isn't that cool? Continually lift up, a, offer a sacrifice of praise to God. And, and that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And so we see the whole, that's the whole bit of Psalm 141, verse 2. You got the prayers and you got the hands going up now. And then it continues. Do not neglect to do good, to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, let's, let's, let's just deal with that word sacrifice because we need a theology for that. And I think that many times we're confused as to how that works. Pastor Pepe was talking about, like, God, we don't have to sacrifice, you know, for your acceptance anymore. And he nailed it. That's correct. I don't sacrifice to God for the forgiveness of sins anymore. See, in the Old Testament, they would have to sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. Right? That was the only way. The blood was the only way that you could have forgiveness of sin. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the sinless Son of God, offered himself a once and for all, unrepeatable sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Amen. And everybody who accepts his sacrifice, right, and they go, oh, I'm in. I accept that by faith. I believe in him. I believe in the work that he just accomplished, and I'm going to apply the blood of Jesus to, you know, to the doorposts of my life. You know, if you do that, you are saved and you never have to offer a, because you're never, your sacrifice for your own sin is it's, it's going to have to be repeatable. But Jesus offers the perfect unrepeatable one. Okay. That's what Christianity is about. The core is just putting your trust in Jesus to cleanse you because you will never be able to cleanse you. Right, so once before you fight by faith, I don't deserve this. This is insane. It's a gift. Okay, now you're in relationship with God because of the sacrifice that Jesus has made. So I'm not sacrificing for the forgiveness of sin. I sacrifice from the forgiveness of sin, because now I'm in relationship with God. 
You following me? And I want to show him that this relationship means something. Right? I want to show I'm in this thing. Dude, I care about you. I want to love you. I want to show you that I love you. Like my relationship with my wife. I want to show you that I love you. What do you love? I love avocado toast. You're getting avocado toast. It's disgusting, but you're getting it. You following me? So when you read to the New Testament, there's all types of sacrifices that, as, we, as we've read in Hebrews chapter 13, there's all types of sacrifices that, that, were, that were not required to for our salvation, but were encouraged to for the maintenance of our relationship in our hearts. You following me? Are you understanding the difference there? Let's keep reading. It's also our job. 1 Peter. This is a fascinating passage. Peter's writing to the New Testament church. He says this, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. We'll parse this passage. Um, when God saved you, there's like a design to your, your spirit. You are designed, so there's like, literally, you are designed as a spiritual brick. A brick is a better, contextually here, the dynamic equivalence is spiritual brick. Right? Making up a spiritual house. Yeah. Right? I don't know if you've ever seen a brick before that's like on a sidewalk. Right? It's just like, buddy, where are your friends? You know? <laughs> you look like you're like, where did he come from? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because based on his design, you know he's not supposed to be alone. Come on. Come on. You following me? So, like, so you are literally designed to be fit into a spiritual house. And this morning, you are fulfilling one of your primary purposes just by gathering. You're, because you are spiritually designed to gather with the saints and make up the house of God. It's crazy. You're doing better than you thought you were. Right? You're like a spiritual guru right now. Right, but it, it feels right because it is right because it's how you're designed. Yeah. And of course, there's all types of awkwardness in church because p churches are full of people and people suck. <laughs> you yourselves, like, but you're living stones, right? Um, at home on your couch eating hot Doritos in your underwear on a Sunday morning, you're a rolling stone. <laughs> you know, no, no direction, as Bob Dylan said. Okay, but here, dressed in your right mind, deodorant on, hopefully, you know, you're a living stone and you're gathered, okay? And you make up a spiritual house. And so as you become the spiritual house, you unlock this next verse, the spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood. And see, that was God's ultimate design from the very beginning. He didn't just want consumers or, or, or people. But he, you're on duty now. So as you come to church and you're fitted in, you become this priesthood. And what do priests do? Priests minister to God, first and foremost, and they minister to others. So when I come to church, I'm not coming to necessarily consume. I'm coming to minister. The first thing, I come in, and the reason why we sing the songs at the beginning is so that you can do your job as a priest and minister to the Lord, which is your first and foremost and highest calling. Isn't that wild? The Westminster Shorter Catechism reads, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to worship God and enjoy him forever. Right, so we, like, we first exist to worship him. And so we lift, we sing to him. You know, we, we essentially reenact the Psalms. David's revelation of that, that God isn't just after burnt offerings. He's after these offerings. He's actually after living sacrifices. It's wild. It's a game changer when you discover why we gather as a church. The challenge as Canadians and Americans, uh, anybody who's living you know, in, in Western society because of our economic system, you know, we live in... in for the most part, a free market. Um, and in the, I like the free market. I'm a big fan of the free market. Um, I like voting with my dollars. I'll give an example. Um, if you open up a cafe in, in downtown Victoria 
and the, 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 the service is slow, and the food comes cold, and the, food, the, the food's awful, and, and, and your, your wait staff are rude, and the music's just off, the vibes are off, I hope that your business shrivels up and dies. <laughs> I will tell everybody to not go there. I will never go there. And I hope you never get a government grant to stay alive. Right? Conversely, if I go in and you're, the people are kind, just, just kind, just be nice. You know what I mean? Like, hey, we, welcome. It's good to see a customer. You know, like, imagine that. Um, you know, it's a good, it's a, and then your food is good. And the vibes are good. And the food is, is edible. It's healthy even. I mean, imagine that. No, there's no seed oils or whatever, you know. You're not poisoning me until I have dementia at 60, right? Um, and just inflamed and all. You know what I mean? Like, that was rude. That was rude. I shouldn't have gone there. I'll, 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 I'll deal with the inflammation. It's fine. You following me, though? If it's a good, I will vote with my dollars, dude. I want your business to thrive. Right, because we want good places. We want, and and the thing that I love about the free market is that consumers decide what's good, and most of the time that's good. So I'm free market capitalism, like baby, I'm I'm in. Okay, the problem is that we bring that into the church, and so instead of at you know at the door checking that consumer vibe. And, and putting on, you know, the priestly garments and understanding why we are gathered, we come in with our, our Yelp review. You know, it's like, oh, Connection Church. They didn't sing, you know, my favorite song, Good, Good Father. It's my favorite song. They didn't sing it. <laughs> Minus one star. You know, it was, a little, it was a little dark in there. Music was a little loud. You know, minus another star. You know, um, you know, where's Pastor Pepe? Who is this freak from Ontario? Zero stars. <laughs> you following me? Right? And, and, and we think that the whole thing is about us. Yeah. When really the posture that we're supposed to take is the posture of the priesthood. Yeah. Where, you know, and obviously you want to look for a church that's good. And you want to look for a church that, you know, people love God. You want to know what they believe and stuff, all that Important stuff, but it's like really though the the reason why I come to church and you know I'm gathering because I'm I'm designed that way and I'm a priest and I've come with my offerings, yeah. right? As we read this passage, the, to be a holy priesthood, what do they do? To offer spiritual sacrifices. What kind? Acceptable ones, <laughs> right? Like like ones that God has asked for. Yes. Well, I I worship God this way. He doesn't care. Why? Because he's a person yeah. and he has preferences. We don't, even, we don't even love humans that way. Why would God, who is the king of the universe, be impressed with how you want to design your spiritual life? When, when, especially when you're the benefactor. Yeah. Like you're the one that gets to be in relationship with a God. Of the, are you kidding me right now? Yeah. You've won the lottery, bro. That's insane that God would even, we don't even deserve it. It's like this gift that he gives us, and it's like, well, you're getting the farty farmer platter. So I don't want the farmy, I don't want that. Give me the avocado toast, it's what I love. Get outside of yourself. Stop making it so about you. You following me? Okay, God, I'm following. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. There's another Psalm of David. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. And then he says this. It's the most random passage in Psalms. Awake my glory. Usually the Bible talks about God's glory, right? But David's going, like he's talking about his glory. So he's saying, God, I'm gonna worship you. And then he starts talking to himself. Awake my glory. And then he tells us what his glory is. Awake, O oh harp and liar. Right? I will awaken the dawn, right? Wake up the neighbors, right? In case you're not aware, David is the Jimi Hendrix of the harp, right? He's a freak. He's a songwriter. He's a music producer. We have his entire discography. 
And he, he, and so uh, the way I envision it is he's like, he's plugging into his Marshall stack, right? It's like a wall of Marshalls, right? It's like that scene from Back to the Future. You know, when Marty goes like this and just blows him away, you know? And he's like, what he's saying here is he's going, God, I'm going to worship you, but I'm going to worship you with the very best part of me. Like, I'm going to give you the highest flower of my being. I'm going to shred for you. You follow, you're following me, right? It's, it's the coolest verse ever. Because the truth of the matter is that God has given all of you glory. All glory is from God. Anything that's beautiful in this world is from God. It's transcendent. All beauty is transcendent. There's people that are right and they're true. They're not even Christians, but they possess truth. And that comes from God because all truth is transcendent. There's goodness in our world. And it's people that aren't even Christians and they're good. And that goodness is from God. It's remnants of his grace. It's called common grace. And God gives these beautiful things. And every human being has glory. And this is why David says, give unto the Lord, O you mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord glory that is due his name. So see, when, as Christ, Christian worship is giving back to God the highest flower of your being. It's like, I'm going to worship you, but I'm, I am shredding this worship. Right? And it's not just musical either. You know, so yes, the, the best parts of you. You know, your glory, what is my glory? Your glory is why somebody would text you and ask you for help if you're wondering what your glory is. Your glory is the weight that you bring to the Hebrew word is kabod. It means weight. Right? It's like, it's what you bring to a situation, your expertise, your knowledge. Okay? That's, and that's one facet of it, a major facet of it. Another part of it is your, your dialed inness and, and your spark. It's your, it's your presentness. It's when you're there. Um, I went to a Calgary, don't hold this against me. I think it was last year I went to a Flames game. It was awful. I hated it. I, <laughs> I'm a, I'm, it's sad. I'm a Leafs fan. It's, just, it's like loving a woman that doesn't love you back. So, like, yeah. Unreciprocated love. Um, I hate them. I actually hate the Leafs. That's how much I love you. Because you can only hate somebody as much as you've ever loved them. And that's how much I hate them. Like, it's bad. Um, so I, I go to a Flames game. And um, I'm with friends. You want to go to a Flames game? Sure, take me, you know, take me to the Flames game. And uh, their coach um, at the time was one of the suitor guys. And um, he has a, a Down, Down syndrome son that's about 45. And I don't know if you've ever been to a Flames game before, but in the, uh, you know, at, their, at their, their arena, uh, between the second and third period, they, they have this, the, you know, the Greg Suter moment. And they put a, a spotlight on the Down syndrome son and they play dance music. And he dances as hard as he can for like three minutes you know, to YMCA or whatever is playing. And the, the, the stadium goes electric. Yeah. My buddy's like, you're going to love this. And I'm, I'm like, I am loving this, <laughs> right? Not because we're making fun of him, but because it's glory. Yeah. He's not a good dancer, but he's so present and so going hard in the paint that it brought glory out of the whole arena. Like it was the most beautiful moment. Glory isn't just you being amazing at something. It's you being there fully and present. You know, I remember the first date with my wife. You know, <laughs> dude, you know, don't want to miss a thing. <laughs> right? It's even when I dream. Yeah. <laughs> right? You're like, you are so, I've never been more present in my life, dude. <laughs> right? Which is dangerous because they remember that. Double-edged sword. <laughs> right? It's like, I'm, I'm here. And I think, that, I think that in our worship, many of us, <laughs> one, of the ways, one of the ways that I love my wife is by listening to her psychotic dreams. Um, <laughs> so she dreams every night. Every night she has a dream. And it's always a crazy dream and um and so we'll be driving and I will you know do you have a dream last night you know and she's like all too willing to tell me <laughs> so I'm driving 
you know what happened last night? I was a, she's Australian, right? Um, I was in Jurassic Park and there was a, I was being chased by velociraptors. <laughs> velociraptors, that's wild, you know? Uh, making eye contact, showing interest. <laughs> <laughs> what happened next, dear? <laughs> yeah. She returns volley, you know? Uh, I, uh, then a Tyrannosaurus came out of nowhere, and, you know, and I'll be driving, keeping us alive, you know, and maybe a dude's like, you know, up on me, and I'm like, you know, calm down, bro, you know, like tailgater, you know, and I'll be like, yeah, uh huh, right, and she'll stop talking, and I, and then I'm getting like, you know, blue steel, and or I'll get that, you know what I mean. Nathan, you know, where are you? God is like a woman. He knows when you're not there. And my point is like, God wants hands. God wants the avocado toast. And there are things that he's clear about. Do good, share what you have with others for in doing so, you know, these such sacrifices are, are pleasing to God. When sacrifices are mentioned in the New Testament, I mean, your body is a living sacrifice. Paul talks about a sweet-smelling sacrifice that was pleasing to God when, when um, the Macedonians, you know, gave, the, in their poverty, they gave to support Paul's ministry. Um, so a lot of, you know, giving, there's, there's many sacrifices, okay? Um, but uh, the point is, is that, we, we, okay, we get it. You know, and the reason why we give our money, by the way, is because it, it actually represents your glory because you get paid for that presentness and your skills. And then when you offer your tithes and your offerings to the Lord, you're going, I am giving you my blood, sweat, and tears. I'm returning to you, you know, because you don't give to a church, you give to God. Yeah. Right? It's, it's your priestly ministry. You're going, Lord, take this, this, this money. It's a symbol that represents my life. That's huge when you give to him. Like, what, a, what, a, what an amazing gift. You offer that up to him. And God, here's my offering. And Lord, here's my hands. But sometimes it's like, God's like, cool, cool, cool. But where's your heart? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I don't know about you, but I mean, I've, this is me. I'm, you know, marriage is continual repentance. And so is Christian worship. It's continual repentance. Is it bit, oh, I'm back. I'm back. I'm sorry. You know, I thought it was the IRS, you know. <laughs> I donated $50 to the Trump campaign in 2016. I don't know why I did it. I did it. I'm sorry. I, just, I got caught up in the hype. You know what I mean? And like, and, and I'm back. And, and she's like, <laughs> angry. Well, I'm, so, I'm sorry, babe. You're Tyrannosaurus Rex. <sighs> then a Stegosaurus. Okay, you know. I, I'm a distracted worshiper. I think we all are. You know, we got, we're like, we got so much on. You know, and you're worshiping, and you know, and we're singing. You know, let me tell you, I wonder what I'm gonna eat. <laughs> you know, is it gonna be steak or tacos or maybe a little enchiladas? Right? Like, <laughs> that's that was for Pepe, obviously. <laughs> Contextualizing. And then you, and you're like, God, I'm sorry, I'm back, right? And th that's what we have to do continually. God, I've been making church all about me. I've been making about my needs, about what I can get. I've been a consumer. I've been a bit selfish. I haven't been faithful in my giving. I haven't been faithful in my worship because maybe, maybe sometimes I don't understand why we do what we do. I don't, I don't, I've, maybe it's been a bit ignorance. Maybe it's just been out of, you know, a little callousness. Maybe you're angry at God, whatever it is. You know, and there's things that we need to work through. You know, God loves you. He's not angry at you. 
He sent Jesus, his son, to die for you. He wants you, he wants you in. He loves you. He looks at you with delight. He's not muttering your name under his breath, whittling a stick up in heaven. <laughs> There's cussing. No, he, like, he, love, he delights in you. He smiles. He's so, he's so, he's, he loves that you're here this morning. The, the, the triune God, the Trinity, are that they're delighting in you right now. And he wants you to come in and, and, and have relationship. And as, a, as an act of thanks, you know, you, we begin to offer, Lord, I love you, you because you first loved me. You gave Jesus, and, 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 I'm, you know, and I've, I've received this gift, and so I'm going to give to you. I'm going to show you that this relationship is, is valuable. In fact, I want it to be the most valuable thing and I'm going to begin to treat it like it is the most valuable thing. And as you begin to do that, it becomes the most valuable thing, right? Why don't you stand with me? There's this principle in the Old Testament. If you look through the entire Old Testament, at every altar that gets built... When the, if the acceptable sacrifice is on the altar, God always shows up with fire. Every single time. He always shows up when there's an acceptable sacrifice. But if the sacrifice is like mailed in, he never shows up. He is faithful to not show up when we're like not into it. But when we offer the acceptable sacrifice, he's there. And this is the principle of glory is that if I give God my hands... And I give him my heart. He shows up with his glory. Right? In the same way in any relationship, if you, if you show up in your glory, they show up in theirs. Right? Because glory begets glory. I think that there's many Christians who, like, they never experience the glory of God because they're kind of coasting. They're just, they're just not there. And God's just going to be like, okay, you're not going to be there. Cool. But God's looking for people who are going, I'm here. He's like, oh, I mean, what would your life look like if God's glory began to just invade your space? As you begin to lean into him, he begins to lean into you. Like, that's wild. See, that's where, that's where Christianity begins to get really exciting. Yes. The principle is this. Every acceptable sacrifice has a divine response. And that's what makes church really exciting for me. When I come in and I'm, I've given and, and I've lifted my hands, even if it's awkward, it's like I don't understand, I don't get, but it's what you love, and, and I want to show you that I love you, and I sing. And I open my heart a little. I know that fire is coming on the altar of my life. As I do this, I know the fire is coming. I don't know when, but I know it's coming. Right? And God's work is, many times it's undetectable, but he's working behind the scenes, right? He's always working. Now, I don't know about you, but I need the glory of God in my life. I need it. I'm desperate for it. I need God in my life. I want him in every part of my life. And so we can have this confidence as priests, as New Testament priests, that when we come before the Lord and we, we do this, we know, God, this is, you love this. This is an acceptable sacrifice. And, and I'm going to give it to you, even though it's weird, it's awkward, it's not culturally what I'm into. I'm a white Canadian, and, you know, I'm conservative. And I, my hand, you know what I mean? Like, we, that's what we are as Canadians. We're not, we're not, you know, demonstrative Americans, you know? Or, like, you know, party-going Mexicans. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, but, but do we love the Lord? And are we going to worship him the way he wants to be worshiped? and set aside our cultural values. That's the challenge as a, as a Canadian church. It's like, you're going to be Canadian, or you're going to follow Jesus. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, because it, it's like, guys, guys, I'm a Canadian. I get it. I grew up, I lived at the arenas. I played hockey. I, I know you. I know you better than you know you. Because I've been living outside, and I've been I'm observing. My parents still pastor in Ontario. And Canadian Christianity, it, it can't be that. It's got to be biblical Christianity where we, we, we give God what he's asked for and our culture doesn't inform scripture. Scripture shapes us. You following me? 
Now, I'm not, we're not going to do a thing where, we demand, you know, I demand that everybody, that's not, because that's, that's not what we do either. God loves a cheerful giver. This is between you and God. But I know this, he loves your hands. And I think he'd really love it if you lifted them to him. Just a little. It's between you and God, I don't care. I'm going home tonight to see my son. It's going to be awesome. This is between you and the Lord. Maybe you haven't been faithful and you're giving. Maybe you've never given before to the Lord. I want to challenge you. Take up your priesthood. Take up your purpose. If you're comfortable, maybe, just, maybe you've never lifted your hands. Just do this one. You're like, oh, that's huge for you. Maybe you're here and you're like, whoo, that's glory for you. I'm just going to lift my hands. I'm not looking. I'm just going to pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that this isn't about, you know, behavior modification or everybody having to do this. We, we just want to love you the way that you have revealed yourself. We want to give you the avocado toast, Lord. We want to love you. We want to worship. The Father is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. We want to be those worshipers. God, we've been... Um, we're distracted worshipers. We're ADD worshipers. And we've got our Canadian issues. We like to be polite. We don't like to be weird in public. We're working through it. You know, it's just we're awkward. And, but we want to love you, Lord, the way that you want to be loved. And so, Lord, help us to set aside some of, our, some of that cultural baggage that we have. And help us to put aside maybe like even traditions that we were raised in. We, it's unfamiliar. Um, we want to be people who like when we read, when, when you self-define, we're going, okay, I'm in. We want to be priests. And forgive us, Lord, when we make worship about us, when it, it's really, it's all about you. We want to come back to that heart of worship where it's all about you. We thank you that you are super patient and insanely kind and you're just mercy, 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 mercy. And you're always drawing us more into relationship. But that deepening relationship means that we begin to really center you, not us. That's right. yes, Lord. So God, we like decentralize ourselves in this moment. And we platform you again. We put Jesus at the center, Jesus' words at the center. Forgive us for projecting onto you and telling you what you're like and what you like. And Lord, help us. Give us the courage and the confidence and the boldness to, to put your words at the very center. We love you, Jesus. Thanks for being patient with us. Well, that's all that we have for you today. If you like the message that you just heard, don't forget to like it. Let us know your comments below and share it with as many people as possible. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and our website. And if you're in Victoria, BC, Canada, we would love to see you this upcoming Sunday. God bless you and see you soon.